Hello, everyone. Welcome to our lecture series on Asia Loops. On Asia Loops. So today we are looking at Asia Looted Springs and Bags, which is Unit 2 of our course unit on strength of materials. We are looking at the formation of members and the axial loading. Now looking at what we have on our screens, if we have a beam or a bar with Total length of L. The total length of the bar is L. If this bar undergoes axial loading, a force is applied at the end, and the forces set up stresses in the bar and causes the bar to change its length by delta. As you can see from here, delta. Then how do we determine the value of delta? or the change in length as a result of the axial force which has been applied to the bar. So we stated from the tensile test that at the proportional limits, the stress is proportional to the strain and we have this equation. So if our stress is force over area, if the stress is force over area, and our strain, we stated that our, our strain is the modulus of elasticity. And we stated that our strain is the change in length, which is delta over the original length. So from this equation, if we make delta the subject, we are going to get delta is equal to the formula here. So this is the formula which we are going to use to determine the amount of deformation caused by an axial loop applied to a beam, where the T is the force applied, L is the original length or the length of the material, it is the area, and then the E is the modulus of elasticity. We see from this formula that the deformation is proportional to the force applied it is also proportional, inversely proportional to the area and also inversely proportional to the material property, which is modulus of elasticity. Therefore, anytime you are given a complex structure, you need to divide your structure into smaller sections, which will enable you to calculate the total deformation. For example, if I have a structure like this, and in this structure, I have two forces applied at different sessions. I have two forces applied at different sessions. Let's take it that I apply P1 at this side. And I also apply another force P2 at this side. We see from here that the force P1, which is applied to the material or the body, when we look at this section or this part of our structure, yes. so if we want to determine the amount of deformation caused at this session, let's take it at this point here is A. If we start from A, you can see that as you are moving upwards, you have not encountered the force two or the force P2. Therefore, the deformation of all this side, where we have not encountered the force of two, will only be, this portion will only be deforming as a result of this P1 applied. However, when I consider a point here, if I want to get to this point and I'm starting from this side, you realize that as I have encountered force one, I've encountered force two, 
So up to that point, I've encountered both force one and force two. Therefore, the deformation at the point here will be as a result of the force P1 and the force P2. However, at the point here where we have not encountered the force F2, the formation will only be as a result of force P1. It therefore means that anytime you want to determine the total deformation caused in the body, you have to, anytime you encounter a new force, you need to divide into a new session, which will be, help you to be able to determine the total deformation. For example, our structure as we have there, we said that we have P1 here, this is P1, and another force P2 has been applied at this side. So it means that as you are moving from the starting point here, once we encounter the force P2, we need to divide into sections so that we calculate the deformation here, which is delta one, as a result of only P1. I also calculate the deformation here as a result delta two, as a result of the combined effect of P1 and P2. And therefore, our total deformation there will be equal to delta one plus delta two. That is the first instance when we are considering the forces acting on the material. What if we also have a structure whereby the area of the material is changing? For example, if I have this structure here, and let's say that just a single force is applied at this side. This is a rigid support at this side. This is a rigid support. Now you can see that from this point up to this point, the area, the, the diameter is changing, and so the area is also changing. And from this point to that point, that's a similar diameter. So for us to illustrate or to get the total deformation of this structure, we need to, let's take it that the, the diameter for this one is D1, and the diameter for this side is D2. The diameter for this side is D2. For us to be able to calculate the deformation, we need to determine the deformation associated with D1 and also the deformation associated with D2, and then we put them together as delta total deformation is equal to deformation to diameter one and the deformation to diameter two. Since we are saying that the deformation is inversely proportional to the area, which in this case diameter is also a factor. If it is a rectangle, then we also divide according to the area. Good. So anytime the diameter is changing or the area is changing, we need to divide the sections so that we calculate the deformation associated with each of the sections. And the last one is modulus of elasticity. So anytime we have different materials, let's take it that we have a structure here, but this structure we have still at one end, and then one end is aluminum. Because we are saying that the modulus of elasticity varies from one material to another. This E varies from one material to the other. So it means that the modulus of elasticity for aluminum is different from the modulus of elasticity for steel. And for that matter, we cannot easily determine the deformation at once. We need to divide into the different materials, determine the deformation for the aluminum, and also determine the deformation for the steel. And for us to get the total deformation, we sum the deformation for the aluminum and the deformation for the steel. So it therefore means that anytime you are given a bar to analyze or to get the total deformation, there are three conditions which are very important. The first one is forces. Anytime you encounter a force, you need to divide that to different sections. So the first one will be force, which will guide your division. The first one will be force. Once you encounter any new force, you divide into a new session. The second one is once you encounter a different material, you also divide into sections. And the third instance is once you encounter different diameter or changes in area, changes in the area, 
you also have to divide your component into sections. And for that matter, we result in this formula here. And this formula is the total, this formula is the total deformation when we have a complex structure. And this I refer to the different sections we have, the different sessions we have. So that is what is going to guide you to divide your complex structure into sessions. Okay, let us look at an example on this. Good. Yes, let us look at that. An example on that, we are told that we have this bar and we are asked to determine the deformation in the steel rod under the given load. So how do we solve this question? First of all, we need to divide our complex structure into various sections. We need to divide our complex structure into various sections. Here we are told that we are only given one modulus of elasticity which means that the entire structure here is only made up of steel. So we will not worry ourselves dividing according to material or the modulus of elasticity. However, we can see that different forces are applied at different sessions, and we can also see that the diameter is changing. Looking at this question, this side is the rigid support. You can see that this one is the rigid, the rigid support. This is the free end. So always start your analysis from the free end. And from this free end, if we start here, let's say that this is A, we can see that as you are moving along, we encounter a change in diameter. And we said that any time you encounter a change in diameter, you divide that section. So we can call this B. So A to B will be one section. Though there is also a force there, but because at that same point where the force is acting, we are dividing according to the diameter. So we are going to consider that as one unit. Then at this side, as we are moving along, you can see that we have encountered another force. And because you have encountered another force, you said that anytime we encounter a new force, you divide into session. So because you have encountered a new force, you're also going to get a new session. We can call this C. And then the last side here, as we are moving along, we don't encounter any change in diameter and there's no new force. So that whole section can be taken as the third section. So we have section one, section two, and section three. Therefore, we will calculate the deformation associated with section one, the deformation associated with section two, and the deformation associated with section three. And that is what we are going to do. Take note that we are not going to use this external forces here. We are not going to use these forces here. Rather, for us to calculate the deformation, we are going to cut at the middle side of each of the sessions. So let's say that from A to B, we are going to cut at the middle part of that session. And from, from sorry for, for that, from B to C, we are also going to cut the middle side of that session. And from C to D, we are also going to cut the middle portion of that session. And we determine the internal diameters, the internal forces at the middle session of each of the three different sessions we have divided our structure into. So quickly, let's look at what we have from the next page. Allow me to erase. Yes, so this is the solution. What we are going to do is that first of all, we said that we are going to divide into sessions and we had three sections from the previous screen. So from here, we can say that the first session from a to B, where is A is labeled as D to C. So we cut at the middle side, and this is our 30 kips is here. And to every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. Therefore, the force there 
the force within or the internal force can be called E3, opposite reaction. And when we pick the second session, we also cut at the middle portion. But take note that at the middle session, the force here is affecting whatever is here. That is why we started our drawing from the end point. That's why we started our drawing from the end point. And we also do the same for the third session or the first session here at the middle. And that is going to give us a free body diagram like that. Once you have been able to do this, we determine the value of P1, P2, and P3. So let's start with P1. Every force which is going to the left is negative. And when the force is going to the right, it's going to be positive. Force to the left is negative. Force to the right is positive. So once you have been able to do that, let's determine our P3. We can look at P3 is going to the left. So we have negative P3. The 30 is going to the right. So plus 30 to be equal to zero. Then from there, we can say that P3 to be equal to 30 fifths. In the same way, we can determine P2. Now P2 is going to the left, so negative P2. Forty-five caps is going to the left, negative forty-five. And our thirty here is going to the right, plus thirty is equal to zero. Then from here we can calculate negative which we send it to the other side and you find out that P2 is equal to the force P2 is equal to negative fifteen caps. In the same way, we can determine P3. So P3, we have P1, P1. So P1, we can see that P1 going to the left is negative. Plus 75 going to the right, positive. Minus 45 going to the left, which is negative. Plus 30 going to the right, which is positive is equal to zero. And from here, we can see that P1, when you do that math, P1 should be equal to 60, 60 hips. And that is what we have here. If you have caves, caves is one cap is equivalent to 1,000 pounds. 1,000 pounds. That's why you have seen that we have to the power three and send to the power three. So once you have been able to do this, we just determine the deformation associated with each of the sections individually. So now our deformation will be called the summation of all the various deformations. So we pick section one. The force there is P. The force there is P3. And the length of that session, take note, the length of that session is from this point to that point. And that is 16, from the question is 16 inch. Then, so that is what we have here. 30, the force is 30 times 16. Then we determine the area. You know that area of a circular structure is pi b square on four, or it can be pi r squared. It can be pi r squared. So that is what we use to determine the area here. And we have been doing the diameter of the small section as small, small d1, small d1, which was given in the question. So with that, we can be able to evaluate the area of that side, which is this. And the area of that, this bigger diameter was also given and we can, the diameter was given, and we can put them into our formula to get this area using these formulas here. And once you have been able to do that, the second session, allow me to clean this side so that you can be able to see the second session well. Take note, when you are considering the length of the session for the second one, we said that the second session was starting from this point, 
starting from this point here and ending at this point. So from the question, from this point to that point is 12. We are only considering the length of the session. So don't add from this point to that point. No, don't add this length to it because the section is only from this side up to that point. So the length of the session is this, and that is 12. And in the third instance also, the length of the session will be from B to B. Don't add this length because you have already determined the information in that side. And then you put them in this formula here because we have the same material, we decided to factorize the modulus of elasticity out and we put the rest in their areas. And once we substitute them in, you should be able to get the information here. You can go through that math to determine the total information associated with the structure or with the body. Good. So once you have been able to determine the deformation, our question now becomes very easy for us. Now let's go to the next slide and see what we can do. Good. So let's look at example two also and see how we are going to solve our example. The rod ABC is made of an aluminum for which modulus of elasticity is equal to 70 GPA. Knowing that P is equal to 6 kN and Q is equal to 42 kN, determine the deflection of point A and the deflection of point B. So this is the structure. First of all, we have already established the fact that anytime you are giving the structure, you are going to you are going to divide the complex structure into sections into sections using three conditions. The first one is using forces applied. Forces, anytime you encounter new force, the second one is material. Is a material. And then the third instance is using the area, the area. So looking at this question, this side is fixed. We said that always start your analysis from the free end. So here we are going to start our analysis from point A. As we move from point A downwards, you can see that at B, there's a change in diameter, therefore we divide. So A to B will be one section. And from B to C, it's a uniform diameter. We are not encountering any force. We were given only one modulus of elasticity. So it means that we only have one material there. So here we can divide into two sections, one and two, from A to B and from B to C. So let's determine the deformations associated with A and the deformation associated with B. And from there, we can be able to determine the deflection of point A and also the deflection of point B. Good. So let's quickly look at the solution for this problem. This is the solution. So we stated that first of all, you divide your material into sessions. So we are divided into A, B, and B to C. From there, you can just determine the internal forces in A, B, the internal forces in B to C. So if you draw the free body diagram like this for A to B. Sorry, let me make it straight. When we draw our free body diagram from A to B, we have our structure like this. We have A, our force pointing upward, and we are told that it is six, and then we can get our force internal, the internal force within as P1. So from here, we can say that force P1 should be equal to 
because P1 is pointing downwards. So negative P1 plus 6 is going up. So its positive is equal to 0. And from here, we can say that P1 should be equal to, should be equal to 6 kilonewtons. And we can also be able to determine the force in from B to C. So from the force to B to C, our free body diagram is going to be like what we have here. And we can say that P, which we are told is six, is going up, is positive. We have Q coming down, so it's going to be negative. And we are told that the value of that is 42. And then we have PBC, which is also going down, so negative is equal to zero. And from here, we can say that P2 or PBC should be equal to negative 36 kilonewtons. Once you have been able to do this, what follows is to determine the total deformation in each of the sessions, in each of the sessions. So when we pick from A to B, from A to B, this should be our formula for the total deformation. And um, we already know that our force, the internal force in AB is six. So that is there. And the length of AB from this point to that point is four. Then we can get the area. The area as usual is pi r square or pi b square on four. And you know that pi is equal to three point three point. One four two, three point one four two, three point one four two. So we can calculate the area, and then we are also doing the modulus of elasticity. Therefore, we can go through that here, and we get our deformation from A to B. For BC, we can also do the same thing. We can calculate. We know the force in BC is negative thirty six, so we put the negative thirty six. And the length of BC, the length of BC is from this point to that point, which is 0 0.5. 0 0.5. So we can also do that, and we get our total deformation here. But the question asks us to determine, the A part of the question was asking us to determine the total displacement of point A. This point here, point A. So you can see that this is where we have our rigid support. This is where we have our rigid support. So moving from this rigid support to point A, you can see that you will encounter B to C and you also encounter B to A. Therefore, the displacement of A, starting from where we have our rigid support or our reaction, then you can see that as you are moving there, you will pass from B to C and from A to B. So it means that the deformation or the displacement of A is as, as a result of the deformation in BC and also the deformation in AB. Therefore, if you want to get the displacement at A, it should be the deformation of AB plus the deformation of BC. And that is what we have done here, giving us this total answer. And the next question is to determine the deformation of site B. The deformation of site B is going to be this. It's going to be only the information of this point B. As you are moving from now, you can see that you only encounter the session BC. And so the information of B is only as a result of the information of BC. And that is why we are getting this answer. That is pretty much simple. I hope you get the concept very well. In case you have any question on that, you can also let me know and I'll be glad to help you in understanding that concept. So once we are done with this, we have solved two examples. You can try this question on your own, even as you go home and you see whether you have these answers here. So now let's go to the formation of, the formation of carpet bars or continuous loading formation of carpet bars or continuous loading by axial loads. So what we are saying is that what you have described there, if you remember, 
we stated that you are always going to divide your structure in sections. But if I have a structure like this, if I have a structure like this, If I have a structure like this, sorry for that. Let's take it that this is cylindrical. Let me clean this side and redraw it again. Now you are seeing that if this is cylindrical and this is a rigid support, there's a rigid support at this session. Then you can see that as you move from this point A to point B, the diameter keeps on changing. The diameter keeps on changing until you reach B. There's a continuous change in the diameter and also a continuous change in the area. So for that matter, you cannot decide. There's no way you can be able to divide the structure into the different sections and calculate the total deformation. So when we have this, we refer to it as the tablet, as the tablet bar, as the tablet bar. And in this case, you cannot divide into session. In the second case is when you have a body with continuous or distributed loading. So when I have, let's take it that this one is my support, and the forces there are continuous, continuous loading continuous loading or distributed loading. When I have the forces distributed this way, it will be very difficult for me to also divide this section according to how the forces are acting. And therefore, when it comes to that, we are going to use the method of integration. Anytime you have structures like that. And the third instance is when you have a body coming under its own weight. For example, if if I have a body, a bar like this, and the bar is the bar is hanging under its own weight. We see that if this bar is hanging at its own weight, at this point, the distribution of the force will be different. And at this point here, the distribution of the force is also going to be different. And even just before this side here, the distribution of the force is also going to be different. And so when you have these three different scenarios, then you are going to apply because the loading is continuous or distributed and the area is also changing as at every point in time, we are going to use the idea of integration to get our total information. And this kind of integration is just what we refer to as summation. Integration is just summation. And so in that case, you are only going to continue consider a small change in length, a small change in length like that, and we refer to that as x. So therefore, the information associated with this length is going to be delta x. And for that matter, because the force might also be changing with respect to the distance x, the area might also be changing with the distance x. So our stress is going to be a force over the area, and our deformation is equal to will be equal to the, the small change in length over the small length which we are considering. And when you put them into our Law, which we are saying that up to the proportional limit, the stress is proportional to the strain. In that case, we are going to get our formula in this manner. We are going to get our formula in this manner. And from here, we can be able to get our total deformation. We can be able to get our total deformation using this formula here. And from there, our total deformation will be given by this formula. As we integrate from the start point, which the length is zero, 
up to the final length of the material or the bar, which is given as L. Then we get the total deformation of the whole structure. With this, let us solve an example on these tapered bars. Let us get an example on these tapered bars. So we are saying that the bar has a cross-sectional area of three inch squared. This bar and modulus of elasticity is equal to 35 times 10 to the power three is ESI. Determine the displacement of its ends and when it is subjected to distributed loading. So here we have been given the force as a function of X. We have been given the force as a function of X. So what we need to do is to integrate the force to get our PX. So if we want to integrate the force, we just put this thing there. So our whole thing is going to be 500, 500 X raised to the power one over three. And if we have this, if we are integrating, you just add one to the power and you divide by whatever it's resulting, which is one over three plus one. And from there, we are going to get 500 X raised to the power one over three plus one is going to be three over four over three. And this side is going to be three on four. Then from here, we can get, get find the reciprocal of the denominator. And it's going to be 500 X raised to the power four over three. And to find the reciprocal of the denominator here, which is going to be four over three. And from there, our whole thing is going to be, sorry, this was supposed to be four over three. And when you find the reciprocal, it's going to be three over four. Sorry for that. And from here, the whole thing is going to be three times 500, which will give us 1,500 x to the power four over three over four. And this will be our force. This will be our force. So once we get the force, we put it in our formula for getting the total information. We put it in this formula. Where now our force is Ps, and then we have our area is given as three inches, and the young modulus is given as 35 times 10 to the power three kxi. Take note of that, we have 35 times 10. Sorry for that, let me write it well. We have our formula as 35 times 10 to the power 3 PSI. If we have KSI, KSI is also times 10 to the power 3, this KSI. So we are going to get 35 times 10 to the power 3 times 10 to the power 3 again. And that will give us 35 times 10 to the power times 10 to the power 6. And that is what we are having here. And our area is 3. And because the area and the modulus of elasticity are all constant, you can bring them outside the integration sign and we integrate whatever is left, which is the 500 over 4, x is the power 4 we have here. But we are going to integrate from the start. So at this end here, the length is zero. As we increase to this point, the length is four. But we are, we are noted that the length is given in feet so it means that look at the area, the area is in inches and this is in KSI. So it means that we need to change from feet to, we need to change from feet to inches. And we know that 12 inches is equal to one feet. Therefore, if we have four feet, you are going to get four times 12 and that is what is indicated here. And our function is here. So we integrate whatever is under or uh, behind the integral function. And what we do that, when you integrate again, 
what is under the integral function, we said that if you are integrating, you add one to the power and then you divide by whatever is there. So here we have the power of x is four over three. So we are going to add one to that, of which we are going to get seven over three. So we are going to get x from here, we are going to get 1,500 x raised to the power seven over three all over four times our seven over three again, seven over three again. And that is going to give us, we find the reciprocal of this, we are going to get 1,500 times whatever, the young modulus here we have, so we have over four times three over seven. And our h is s raised to the power seven over three. S raised to the power seven over three. Once we have this, we just put in the value of x when it's equal to zero, and everything that will be equal to zero, and then you put in whatever is here. And that is what has been done here to get the final information of the structure. It is much simpler. If you have any challenge with that, you can also let me know. But I believe we have all understood the concept on this. Now let's quickly run to what we have next, which is statically indeterminate problems. Statically indeterminate problem. So if we have what the structure which we have on our screen, you can see that the whole thing is supported at A. Everything is supported at A. There's a fixed support and there's also a fixed support at B. From basic mechanics or from statics, if we try to draw the free body diagram of whatever is there, we are going to get our free body diagram in this form. At A, if we cut from the support, we are going to get a reaction at A, which we can call as FA. FA. Also, if we cut at B, there is going to be a reaction at B, which can be called FP. And at this point, you already have our external force P applied. From this, we have three equilibrium equations. Sum of F of X is equal to zero. Sum of F of Y is equal to zero. Sorry for that, is equal to zero. Also, sum of moment at every point in time to be equal to zero, to be equal to zero. By looking at these three equations, we don't have any force in the X, so we cannot use this equation. We have forces in the Y, we can use this equation, but all the forces are passing through the center of gravity. They are passing through the center of gravity. Therefore, the moment will also be equal to zero. Therefore, we can only write equation using f of y. And from there, we can say that f of a plus f of b plus f of b plus our external for speed should be equal to zero. And that is what we have here. But this external force P will be given to you in the question because it is an external force. So we have, we know P, but we don't know F of B, which is a reaction at B, and we don't know F of A, which is a reaction at A. And for that matter, in the equation which we have just written, there are two unknowns. But looking at what we have, we only have a single equation. And we know that anytime we have equations with two unknowns, we need a minimum of, if we have two unknowns in an equation, we need a minimum of two equations to solve. Here is the case we only have one equation. And therefore, because we have one equation with two unknowns, we cannot be able to determine the reactions at the support. We cannot be able to solve for F of A and F of B. And that is what we refer to as statically indeterminate problem. It means that we cannot only use the idea of status to determine the reactions at the support. 
So we should find a way of dealing with such kind of situation. Anytime you have such kind of problem, there are two ways to determine the reactions as support. You can use the superposition method or the flexibility or the force method of analysis. That is number one. And you can also use the compatibility or the kinematic condition. That is number two. So we are going to use superposition or flexibility or force method of analysis to look at how we are going to solve statically indeterminate problems. And then after that, we also use the kinematic or the compatibility method to determine the solution of a problem. So quickly, let's look at the superposition method and see how we are going to analyze using the superposition method. Then after that, we will go to the compatibility condition. And they also use the compatibility method for the compatibility condition to solve for our external for the reactions at the support. So quickly, let's look at a method of superposition. Let's look at the method of superposition. So this is what we are going to do. Sorry about these ones. I don't want us to consider them. So we are going to solve this example using the method of superposition. Using the method of superposition, this is what we are going to do. First of all, we are going to, if we have any structure like what we have here, we are going to, you can see that there's a reaction at support A and there's also a reaction at the support B. So what you are going to do is that using the superposition method, the superposition method, Using the superposition method, first of all, we are going to draw the free body diagram of the entire structure. And we assume that all the supports are taken away. So we have F of A, and then we can also get another side here called F of B. And then we have our external force here. So using this free body diagram of our structure, we are going to write the equilibrium equation, which we are going to get F of A, which we are going to get it as F of A plus F of B plus or minus P, sorry for that, minus P plus F of B minus P. P is coming down. That's why it's minus P is equal to zero. So once you have written this, we are going to assume two things to give us what we have here. The first thing we are going to assume is that one of the reactions, one of the support, we are going to assume that one of the support is not there. One of the support is not there. So for that instance, let's take it that the one at P is still there. And we are saying that one of the supports are not there. So let's take it that the support at B is not there. And we assume that for the deformation there, the deformation to the bar is only caused by the external force P. So in that case, whatever deformation which is going to happen there, or whatever deformation which is going to cause there, is as a result of only external force which has been applied to the bar, not the reactions at the support. So we assume that the deformation, because we assume that one of the rigid ends are not there, the deformation caused to the bar is only as a result of the external force P. Then in the second condition, we are going to assume that there's no external force acting. And one, the reaction at the support, which we already took away, is the one which is now causing the deformation. So in that case, our whole structure is going to be like this. And we assume that there is no external force applied. There is no external force applied. So whatever deformation there is only being caused by the reaction at 
G, which we took away in our first assumption. So the reaction at the F of D is the one portion the deformation, and there's no external force. So in that case, the deformation is going to be deformation as a result of D. And from there, we can say that you can see in this structure because everything there, because the rigid supports are going to prevent, because the rigid supports are going to prevent the whole structure from elongating freely. So we can say that when you sum the deformation of P plus the deformation as a result of the support at B, it should be equal to zero. But in this question, there's a gap there. You can see that there's a small gap there to allow for expansion. So in that case, the deformation of P plus the deformation of B should be equal to the small gap which is there. But this one is just an explanation of the concept. So from this equation, once we write the deformation for this, the deformation for that, we can be able to calculate the reaction at the support FD. And once we have been able to determine the reaction at the support FD, we put it in this first equation here to determine F of A. And that will help us to get the reactions at the support. So that is the method of superposition. Quickly, let's use that idea to solve this question which we have here. Let's use that idea to solve this question which we have here. So let's move on to our next page and see how that question is being solved. Good. So as I explained in the earlier slide, we are saying that we assume, first of all, we are going to assume that deformation is only caused by the external force. And there is no support at one of the sessions. So there's no support at B. So the deformation the G is only as a result of the external force. And the second instance is when we assume that there's no external force and the deformation is as a result of the reaction we took away in our first assumption. So the deformation is as a result of B. So first of all, now we can say that there is a small gap. Looking at the question, there is a small gap There's a small gap between the support B and the rod, and that small gap is 0 0.2 meters. So we can say from our compatibility equation that the deformation as a result of the external force plus the deformation of the external of the reaction and the support F B should be equal to this small gap, which is there, which is 0 0.2. So we change that to meter and we are going to get 0 0.0002 meters. Once we have been able to, once we have been able to determine that, the next thing we need to do is to be able to establish this condition. You can see that looking at our diagram, which we have, looking at our diagram, which we have, we can see that as this external force is elongating the material, looking at the direction of that force, it's going to elongate the material in this direction. However, the reaction at the support B is going to move in this direction. So as one is going to the positive direction, the other is going to the negative direction. That is why in our equation, we are having the deformation as a result of the external force to be equal to negative. And once you have been able to do that, once you have been able to do that, now we put in our deformation equation as a result of external force B and our deformation equation as a result of the reaction of the support B. And then we write our equation. We know that the external force is 20 times 10 kilonewtons times you, when we are considering the external force, you can see that from where the external force has been applied, from where the external force has been applied, because from all this side, from all this side going, we are not encountering any force, we are, but we encounter a force at this side. This is going to be session one, and this is going to be session two. So we calculate the deformation for session two and the deformation for session one with regards to the external force which has been applied. 
However, you can see that for section one, when you draw the free body diagram, when you cut at the middle side and you decide to draw the free body diagram, there is no external force. There's no external force at the other end. And therefore, P1 is equal to zero. And if P1 is equal to zero, whatever is there is going to be zero for the first session one. But the session two, there is a force applied. And so when we draw, when we cut to the middle of session two, we can get our diagram like this. We have the force applied here. The force is applied at this side. So the force is going this direction. This is 20 kilonewtons. And then our P2 will go in this direction. So P2 will be equal to our 20 kilonewtons. And that is what we use in this equation. And you can see that the length of that session is 0 0.4 from the question. The length of that session is 0 0.4 because the session is going to be only from this point up to that portion. And that is what is giving us the 0 0.4. And the area, as you have seen, is 5 square on 4 times the modulus of elasticity, which we are giving us 200 times 10 to the power 9. Then we calculate the deformation for that side. And also the deformation at B, we can see that at B is only a single force. And from this to that, you don't encounter any force. And it has the same diameter and the same modulus of elasticity. So we are only going to do one calculation. Our force, when we cut at the middle, our force is going to be FB. FB. And the length will be from this point up to that point. Up to that point, which is 0 0.4 plus 0 0.8, 0 0.4 plus 0 0.8. And that will give us 1.2, which is used here. And we can calculate our deformation from that side. Once we have been able to do that, we just put the deformations here and equate to 0 0.002, which we had already established. And that is what we are getting from here. And that will help us to evaluate the value of F and calculate the value of F from here. And that is what we are getting here. Once you have been able to calculate the value of F, now you go to your total equilibrium equation. Our total equilibrium equation, when you consider, when you consider the total equilibrium equation, the total equilibrium equation, when you consider our free body diagram, it's going to be like this. The force P is applied here. And we have a reaction and support F of A at this side. And we also have another reaction at the support F of B at this side. So you can see that from here we are getting F of negative F of A plus 20. 20 is going to the right. So positive minus the F which you have calculated going to the left negative is equal to zero. And from there, we can also calculate our FP. Since we have already calculated FP, we put it in to get our FP. And that is all for using the superposition method to determine the reactions at the support. And I believe that is very clear. We can all go through that. And if you have any question, you can let me know when we, we come to class. When we come to class, good. Good, so we can now go to solve the question using the compatibility equation. Using the compatibility equation. Now the compatibility or the kinematic method is a bit different from that of the superposition. You can see that in the superposition, we added the deformation as a result of the external force plus the deformation as a result of the reaction at one of the support. And that helped us to determine the reactions at one of the ends. But for the compatibility equation, what we are going to do is that we are going to only use the reactions at the support. We are only going to use the reactions at the two supports. So what we do is that first of all, we draw the free body diagram as in this diagram here, and we write our equilibrium equation. So our equilibrium equation is going to be RA 
minus P plus RB to be equal to zero. And this will give us equation one. So once we do this, the next thing we are going to do is to divide at where the external force is going to act. So let's say that this is where the external force is acting. So we are going to divide that side into two, like that. We are going to divide where the external force is acting. And we get to have session one and session two. So for session one, you can see that we have the reaction at the support A. And when we cut the middle of session one, the force there is going to be P1. And in the same time, when we come to session two, we have RAB. So the, when we cut at the middle, the force there is going to be P2. But you can see that because we cut at where the external force is applied, one, at one session, the external force will be pointing down, and the other session, the external force will be pointing upwards. And from there, because the two is, in a, is under a rigid support, the bar is under a rigid support, as you can see, if I have the bar like this, and this point is A, this point is B. With respect to A, this B is not going to change in length. So there will not be any deformation of the point B with respect to the point A. Because there are two rigid supports, though the structure wants to expand, but these rigid supports are going to prevent that total expansion of the road. And for that matter, the deformation of B with respect to A is going to be zero. And that is what we refer to as the compatibility or the kinematic condition. So once you have established this, then it means that the two portions, portion one and portion two, they are going to deform, but their total deformations should be equal to zero. So the deformation for this portion one plus the deformation of this portion two should be equal to zero. That's why we are saying that the delta four deformation one plus the delta for deformation two should be equal to zero. And from there, if you write the equilibrium equation for this session one here, you can see that RA should be equal to P1. But for this session two here, you can see that when you write the equilibrium equation, RB is going up, so RB is going to be positive. P2 is also going up, so it's also going to be positive is equal to zero. So from here, we can see that RB will be equal to negative P2, or P2 is equal to negative RB. So though that the, in the formula, this side is plus, but because of this RB is equal to negative P2, that is why you can see that here we are having the minus sign for the reaction at B, the information for the reaction at B. And once we are done this, we will get equation two, and then we solve equation one and equation two simultaneously to get the reactions at the support, to get the reactions at the support. So that was pretty a bit very simple. Let us look at the first question we solved using the superposition method. I also solve the same question using the we solve the same question using the compatibility method, and we see whether we are going to get the same thing at the end. So solving this using the compatibility method, the same question we solved earlier on. So in the compatibility method. Let's see how we are going to solve that. So we said that first of all, you draw your three-body diagram for the whole thing, and this is a three-body diagram for the whole thing. So the three-body diagram for the whole thing will help us to write the equilibrium equation. Looking at the direction of F is going to the left negative, F is also going to the left negative, but P is going to the right, this is positive. So we have written our equilibrium equation. And we said that we are going to divide, for the compatibility, we are going to divide our structure into two parts at where the force has been applied. So we are going to divide at this session where the force has been applied. So this will be session, this will be session one, and this side will be session two. So we said that you calculate the deformation for session one and you calculate the deformation for session two. 
and the total deformation should be equal to zero. As in this case, there was a small gap between the point B and the point B prime, and that small gap is 0 0.2 millimeters. So it means that the deformation of B1 plus the deformation of B2 should be equal to 0 0.2 millimeters. And from there, we can write our equilibrium equation. Here, when you cut at the middle, the internal force is going to be Fa, and the length from this side to that side, which we are calling as FAC, and also the area times the modulus of elasticity minus the second half or the second point, FB, which we are saying that when you cut inside here, the force, the internal force there is also going to be FB, and the length from this to that, we can call it L to LCB, and you have the area times the modulus of elasticity. So we put our values from the question inside. We know that the length LAC was 0 0.4. When you look at the question, LCB is 0 0.8. We have FA, FE. We calculate the, the areas plus the modulus of elasticity. And from there, when you simplify, you have our equation two. And we said that we solve, this is equation one. So you solve equation one and equation two simultaneously to get the value of FA and AB. So that was very simple. And I believe each one of us will be able to understand this concept associated with our total deformations. Yeah, so let's move on from there to Statically indeterminate composite bars. Statically indeterminate composite bars. So when we talk about statically indeterminate composite bars, anytime we have two or more bars which are joined together, when you look at this structure that we have here, you can see that we have two one which is has an area of A2 and modulus of A2, and we have Another rod inside which has an area of E1 and is equal E1. So it means that here we have two different materials joined together. Two different materials joined together. So what is inside here is what we have here. And what is outside here is what we have there. So we have two materials joined together. And we have a rigid support at this side and a force is applied at that side. So we want to determine the total deformation or the force which each of the members are carrying. The force which each of the individual bars are carrying. So from there or from here, we can see that when we just take this, this session, when we, pick, we, when we pick this session as here, you can see that the force in this bar here, we can call it P1, and the force, this P1 is the same as the force here, and we can call the force in this other side as P2, and the external force applied is P. So from here, we can write our equilibrium equation. We can say that negative P1 plus negative P2 will be equal to plus P. Sorry for that, these are going to the right, so this should be positive. This is going to the left, so minus P is equal to zero. And from here, we can say that P is equal to P1 plus P2, P1 plus P2. So when we go to the next slide, you see that what that is what we have done there. So from there, P is equal to P1 plus P2. And we have already established the fact that stress is the force over the area. So from here, we can determine P1 and P2. So P1 will be equal to the stress one and area P1, and P2 will be as well equal to the stress two times area P2. And from here, 
That is what you are quoting here. And the deformation associated with D1, the first material, will be equal to this. And the deformation associated with the second force will be equal to that. And from there, because they are composite bars, because they are composite bars, that deformation is going to be the same. So deformation in the first row will be equal to the deformation in the second row. Take note of this. Anytime you have composite bars or bars which are welded together and a similar force is applied to them, the deformation in row one is equal to the deformation in row two. And so from there, we can equate the two deformations as this. And from here, if we make T1 the subject, we are going to get what we have here. We are going to get what we have here. And if we substitute T1 into this first equation here, if we substitute this P1, into our first equation here, we are going to, and we make, and we make P the subject, we are going to get our equation to be in the form of this. So this one, I'll ask you to just try, and then you will see you are going to get what we have there. Good. In the same way, if we had made P to the subject, if we had made P to the subject from here, then our P2 is going to be given by this formula up here. We'll be given by this formula up, up here. We'll be given by this formula up here. And this from, from this formula up here, we can be able to also determine the value of P1. And So we can determine the value of P1 and P2. When we put P2 into our first equation there, that is also going to give us this. And P1 is also equal to that. You can just work through and you find these formulas. And from there, looking at the formulas which you have developed from the first equation, from the equation where we said that delta 1 is equal to delta 2, if you make P over A is equal to P1 over A is equal to stress 1, and P2 over A2 is equal to stress 2. Then from our previous slide, from our previous slide, as we have on our screen here, As we have on our screen here, we can be able from here, from here, if T1 over A1 is equal to stress one, and T2 we divide over A2 is equal to, this is stress one, this is stress two, then we can see that L will cancel L if it has the same length. So we can see that stress one E is equal to stress two E, E2. And from there, we can see that stress one is equal to stress two times the modulus of elasticity of two over the modulus of elasticity of one. And that is what we have developed in our next slide down here. So that is what. That is what we have developed here. Good. So let's solve an example on all this concept on composite bars. Let's solve an example on composite bars. And we will bring our lecture to an end and continue next time. So let's solve this question before we bring our lecture to an end. The steel pipe is filled with concrete and subjected to a compressive force of particular newtons. Determine the average normal stress in the concrete and the steel due to this loading, the pipe has an outer diameter of 50 millimeters and an inner diameter of 70 millimeters. Here is is equal to 200 GPA, this is equal to 24 GPA, the concrete and that of the steel. So let's look at how to solve this question quickly and we bring our lecture to a close.
So from this question, first of all, we said that you draw the free body diagram. So you draw the free body diagram for the whole structure which is there. So we have the four static low newtons acting downwards, and that is here. We have steel, the steel material will exert the force upwards. We call it E steel. The concrete will also exert a force upwards. We can call it P concrete. And from there, we can draw the, we can write the equilibrium equation. If it is coming down, so it's going to be negative. P concrete is up positive. P steel is up, it's also positive. Then we have this equation here. And we know from our previous slide, when we're explaining the concept, that the deformation in the steel will be equal to the deformation in the concrete. So the deformation in steel should be equal to the deformation in the concrete material. And that's what we are putting here. So we write the equation for that of the steel. And then we write the equation for that of, that of the concrete. And we know from the question that the diameter of the concrete is 70. The diameter of the concrete block is 70. But the diameter of the steel, the steel is the outer section. So if you want to get it, the steel is a hollow material. It is a hollow material. It is a hollow material. And so because it is a hollow material, if you want to get this diameter, all these sides are empty, occupied by the concrete. So that is why we are saying that the diameter is going to be the diameter of that of the outer diameter, which we are told that it is eight fifty millimeters minus the inner diameter of the steel of the concrete. So sorry for that. Sorry for that. So the outer diameter. The outer diameter which is 80 millimeters minus the diameter of the concrete is 0.7. And from there, we can be able to get this equation here. And once, when we simplify and we get this equation here, we equate this, we solve this equation one and this equation two simultaneously. And from there, we get the value of the force in the steel and the force in the concrete. Once we're able to do that, the stress is just the force over the area. So we can just put in the area of the steel in this, and the area of the concrete is that. We just put those values there, and we can get the normal stresses in the composite bar. So with this, let's end our lecture here. And if you have any question or we meet in class, you can alert me on that so that I quickly run over it for you. Thank you very much for your time. And thank you for staying in touch with us up to this point. We say thank you for this. We'll end here until we meet again. Have a blessed day. Bye-bye.